All right, let's talk about Apple Silicon. Now, I wanted to shoot this video like two, three days ago, right after WWDC. I had all these reactionary thoughts I wanted to share with you guys. But then as I sat on it, as I let it simmer in my brain, I realized that this was, this was big. This was much bigger than I'd originally thought. Not just for Apple, not just for tech enthusiasts like you and I, but for just the entire computing industry. I think this is going to be, it's going to be something big. Okay, uh, so just to explain in the one sentence, what is Apple Silicon? Apple has this two-year plan to transition their computing hardware, like their laptops and desktops, away from Intel chips to their own custom in-house made silicon, kind of like their iPads and iPhones. So I'm gonna start off this conversation with a topic of hardware. So Apple didn't announce any retail or consumer grade hardware at WWDC, right? They did announce this developer transition kit. It's this Mac mini enclosure equipped with the A12Z chip from the iPad Pro. And it's a device that they did most of the Big Sur demos from during the presentation. It's a $500 kit, but it's a rental, right? You use it as a tool for whatever development purposes that you have. And then when it's done, you send it back to Apple. Very similar to the developer's transition kit they had a few years ago. Now, this is not a consumer grade product. It was meant to it was meant to basically showcase to developers and the world what their path was going forward with these new processors. It's not to be used as some kind of like benchmark or guidance as to what their upcoming consumer grade products are like. Not at all. Like that A12Z is a powerful chip, but that hardware was put out by Apple as something quick and inexpensive for developers to get on board to this whole transition process. The real hardware that is coming out is rumored to be either a 13 inch MacBook device or a 24 inch iMac device. And these are slated to come out at the end of this year or early next year. But in either of these cases, the processors that are in these devices that are coming out for consumer level consumption are invariably gonna be more capable and more powerful than the A12Z that's in that developer kit, like for sure. Now there is something to be taken away from this developer transition kit and it's the price tag. So $500 is a lot cheaper than the $1,000 that they had for the old developer transition kit when they went from PowerPC to Intel. And it makes you think, why is it so cheap? Why is it half the price of the old one? Granted, things are different now, right? Apple is now in a position where there's so many more developers around the world that are making apps and things for the Apple ecosystem. So maybe they want it to be as inclusive as possible, make this kit available to as many people as possible. And there's also the other consideration where Apple's a company now where they're trying to encourage everybody to just get into development. So again, it's like, you know, try to get more people onto this thing. But I think a big part of it is the cost of the components. When they had the old developer transition kit, they had to use an Intel chip. And we've talked about this before in previous videos, Intel stuff is expensive. Like you just can't get away from the price point of Intel's chips. You put one of their chips in your products, you gotta pay up. But this time inside that Mac mini enclosure is an A12Z. It's something that they put in their iPad Pros. It's something they have tons of and they're inexpensive to make. And I think we're starting to see the, the benefits, one of the benefits of what ARM-based chips can do. It's you, you have cheaper stuff. Now I hope, I hope, right, that it's gonna be cheap for the consumers. It's clearly less expensive for Apple to produce a ARM-based Mac mini than an Intel based Mac mini, right? 100% sure it's cheaper to make this DTK than the Intel based thing that they sell to consumers right now. But I, I, I just feel like they're gonna make it cheaper for consumers. I just have this gut feeling. It's so un Apple. And it's, you know, I've seen it in the comments. I've suggested this before and everyone laughs at this idea because Apple's just gonna rip people off. That's what, they, that's what everyone thinks. Well, that's what a lot of people think. But what if they made it cheaper because they can, right? It'd be pretty sick. And if you look at some of the cost breakdown of Apple's products that use custom silicon right now, those chips aren't super expensive, at least not in comparison to Intel stuff. Okay, I wanna move this conversation to software, particularly about the software that they have to use to do this whole transition process. Now, before WWDC, there was a lot of concern from articles and comments that were written about like the difficulty, the obstacle of how hard is it gonna be for Apple to transition both their developers and their user base to this new ARM-based product. And here's the thing about transitions when it comes to moving between platforms like this. The definition of a successful or proper transition is if the user can't even tell that they've made 
the transition, right? For you and I as enthusiasts, we want to see how this is working and we want to understand the nuance of all this stuff. But for the average user, they want this to be as invisible as possible. Like you, you use the old Intel-based Apple product one day, you're using it, and then the next day you switch over to this Apple Silicon-based one and there should be no difference. Your programs, your apps, everything should just be exactly the way it was from your old one. And that would be the dream. That's what Apple wants and that's what the user base wants. And I actually think Apple's gonna pull this off because if you look at their tech demos, they have two tools to make this happen. Their new Xcode will be able to build binaries that can run on both platforms at the same time. So you can have one file that runs both on Intel products and Apple Silicon products. But the most impressive one to me was their demo of Rosetta 2. So this is a tool that allows you to use regular Intel binaries, like stuff that's made for the old, old, but stuff that's made for existing Apple products, download that thing, and then run it on a device that uses Apple Silicon. Now, the example that they use, like the demo that they did during the event was a game. And people looked at this demo the wrong way. When I see the comments about this, like people just missed the point of it. That game is old and the graphics are very unimpressive, but it's not a gaming benchmark. They're not even trying to showcase hardware here. They're trying to showcase the software. The whole idea is that you can take a program or a game that was built for an Intel system, run it through Rosetta 2, and it'll still run. Like without alteration of the code, it'll still run in a very viable form. Now, that being said, I do have some concerns about gaming and graphics dependent apps running on Apple Silicon. During the event, they showcased Maya, but that scene was preloaded and they didn't do any edits that would tax the CPU or GPU very much. It's cool that it runs, but I really would like to see more. And then when it comes to Windows apps and games, there's no boot camp. There's no way to directly boot into Windows. And I think for a lot of people that use their Apple systems to play games, like that's like the that's a very common way for people to play Windows games on Apple systems right now. You can do it through virtualization and stuff down the line, but we'll see how that pans out. The big thing though is that there's no discrete GPU. All of the graphical performance from these Apple Silicon-based systems, I think they have to come from the from the chip, the A14, A13, A15, whatever it is, that's the only thing that can provide the graphics for these systems. Now, if you look at Apple's kind of graphical progress over the years, they've made some big strides in what they've been able to do with graphics on the iPads and their iPhones. It's impressive for tablets and phones, but when you compare that stuff to what we have available from like AMD and Nvidia, there's just no comparison. I think there's gonna be some pressure on Apple to deliver something that is competitive in the graphical department. Like I think their CPU stuff is, that's fine. I think they have that covered. It's just the GPU, not that everyone needs graphics capabilities, but for the people that do, they need to step it up. And who knows, maybe by the end of the year, we're gonna see some really impressive GPU capabilities coming from those new uh, A14 based stuff. Who knows? I actually think that because they can cool these things actively, like they can throw fans on these devices, like for their laptops and desktops, it'll help a lot in terms of what they're capable of. But yeah, I'm excited. I am definitely excited to see what Apple does, not just like this year and next year, but like, what does it look at the two year transition line? What does that look like? Like, you know, Apple, they already have all this stuff planned out. They know the devices and the chips that they're gonna be placing out for the next two years. They know exactly what they're gonna do, but what does that look like? What does the end stage look like? And yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to see this. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thumbs if you liked it, subs if you loved it. I'll see you guys next time.